Support for this podcast comes from the law firm of Davis Malm. Whether you're a developer, property owner, manager, or commercial tenant, their real estate attorneys know the lay of the land, not just the law. Learn more at davismalm.com. Hey, listeners, um, before we get started, today's show references multiple instances of sexual assault. So please take care of yourselves and those who may be listening with you. WBUR Podcasts, Boston. I'm Daryl C. Murphy, and you're listening to The Common. WBUR State House reporter Walter Wuthman, welcome back to The Common. Hey, Daryl. Thank you for having me. Yes, yes. Thank you for being here. So let's just get right into it. Walt, you've been working on a story for the last year and a half, and it's finally out today. It's about how police handle reports of sexual assault. And you focus on an alleged serial rapist who was active in the Boston area from 2016 to 2020. Can you explain who this person is and what the charges are against them? Yeah, so this is a story about a man named Alvin Campbell, who now stands accused and is awaiting trial for raping eight women and attempting to rape a ninth. He's actually the brother of Massachusetts Attorney General Andrea Campbell. Our new investigation, though, finds that before he was arrested in 2020, four different women went to police alleging that they had been raped by Alvin Campbell. Police looked into it, but in each case, they never detained him, arrested him, or charged him with a crime. It was the fifth victim that came forward that actually resulted in any sort of criminal legal action. That's right. Why then and not sooner? It's hard to know. A lot of this reporting has been very difficult because of our privacy laws. We live in a state where all reports, all police reports of sexual assault and domestic violence are kept secret. You know, we've requested a whole bunch of reports. We would love to see the police reports about what they knew and how they investigated these cases and why they decided not to move forward. But we can't. In the absence of that, we have the public court record. You know, I've read through hundreds of pages of documents. Uh, We have applications attached to search warrants, which are a rare public look into these very secret police proceedings. But it's very hard to know why each of these investigations fell apart. We have some clues, though. What are those clues? In one of the cases, prosecutors tell me that the victim essentially did not want to testify. And there's a whole bunch of reasons that could be the case. The public court process can be extremely exposing. You know, people can fear retaliation. Experts say there are many valid reasons that, you know, victims do not want to testify. And it does make it harder to prove a case. In the second case, which happened in 2017, and it was a pair of roommates who were out in downtown Boston, they ran into Campbell at a sports bar called The Harp. Uh, He told them he was a bouncer, and when they couldn't get a ride home, he, you know, it seems he offered them a ride. He took them back to their apartment. They each woke up in tandem to Campbell assaulting them. The first roommate said that she was able to, you know, push him off. The second roommate said she woke up while she was being assaulted by him. They went to the hospital. She got a sexual assault examination kit. There was a DNA match with Alvin Campbell. Both of these women wanted to testify. Prosecutors convened a grand jury, you know, which is what they do when they're seeking really serious charges in a case like this. But the grand jury case fell apart. Prosecutors actually withdrew the case before grand jurors could decide whether to issue charges against Campbell. For a long time, I was trying to figure out why prosecutors did this. Um, I was able to get a summary of an internal memo through Campbell's lawyers, actually, showing that prosecutors felt they could not prove rape against Campbell because the woman was so intoxicated, she, quote, did not remember if she actually said no. I spoke to experts who study sexual assault about this, and they were pretty appalled by that explanation. Um, So I spoke to uh, a professor of criminology at UMass Lowell. Her name is Melissa Morabito, and she really took issue with the prosecutor's statement that the woman could not remember if she, quote, actually said no. Because if you're too incapacitated to give consent, then you cannot give consent. She emphasized that these cases are really hard to prove, but that is not a reason to not bring them forward. Mm -hmm. And I should also say, there is photo and video evidence of many of these assaults. You know, prosecutors say that he had a pattern of filming 
the victims, both before and after sex. Um, This is going to be a huge part of the criminal trial, and it is a reason why prosecutors feel very confident now that they are going to win a conviction. What does this tell us about the police and our legal system when it comes to reports of sexual assault and, and or rape? It shows us that, you know, cases of sexual assault are incredibly hard to prove. And they are chronically under-investigated and under-prosecuted. You know, we have national data showing that only one in five rapes that are reported to police ever lead to an arrest, and then only a fraction of those that lead to arrest ever result in a conviction. Um, And interestingly, that statistic really parallels what seems to have happened here. Four women alleged sexual assault against Alvin Campbell, but he was not arrested until there was a fifth victim who went to police. Prosecutors do not want to bring forward cases they're not going to win. These are really hard, really thorny cases. And there are just, you know, I've spoken to many experts about this. There's so many points in these cases that things can fall apart. And unfortunately, what that means is that it allows, in cases like this, it looks like it allowed someone who was attacking women to continue doing it. Well, Walt, um, we're going to take a break here. But. Alvin's sister is State Attorney General Andrea Campbell. When we get back, I want to talk about how that relationship plays into all of this. So we'll be right back. Did you kill Marlene Johnson? I think you're one of the first people to have actually asked. From WBUR and ZSP Media, this is Beyond All Repair, a new podcast about an unsolved murder that will leave you questioning everything. Somebody should be in jail for murdering my sister. A woman who's never been believed. As long as they think I have done this, then they're not looking for who actually did this. And that's what makes it a cold case. No, it's a botched case. And a search for the truth, once and for all. Wow, it just gets more interesting. Beyond All Repair. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. Be careful. You're digging in a place that's been very peaceful for a while. Do it anyway. Dig. And we're back with WBUR State House reporter Walter Wuthman. So, Walt, we're talking about your story, which looks at how police handle reports of sexual assault. And we're talking about the the individual you focus on, an alleged rapist, Alvin Campbell. Alvin's sister is Massachusetts Attorney General Andrea Campbell. Is there evidence that suggests that she was involved in the handling of the cases against Alvin Campbell in any way? That is a huge question hanging over this case, and, and many people are asking it, as you can imagine. Andrea Campbell firmly denies, one, that she knew of any of these early investigations, and two, you know, she says that she has not spoken to him since his arrest in 2020. She has recused herself from the case as the attorney general, and, you know, she, she did not want to sit with us for an interview, but she sent us a lengthy recorded statement. Um, here's a little bit of what she said. I remain horrified, heartbroken, and devastated by this case. I support survivors of sexual assault without qualification, and I will continue to pray for the survivors in this case who have shown tremendous courage in coming forward. Andrea Campbell was a city councilor at the time of these cases and at the time of his arrest. I put in public records requests for her city emails and text messages from her city phone, anything that was mentioning Alvin or brother. Um, And nothing came back. Mm -hmm. I've asked the prosecutors on this. Uh, The Suffolk County District Attorney's Office firmly says that Andrea Campbell did not have any influence on this case. So I, I have seen no evidence that she had any kind of interference. However, that does not address a separate question, which is that, you know, did did individual investigators, detectives, police officers know who Alvin Campbell was? know about this political connection in his family and sort of walk it back because of that. Right, right. Yeah, that's my next question for you. Do we have any evidence that they were a little hesitant to treat this case as they would treat others, you know? 
It's hard to know. Um, So over and over in this case, I have asked the Boston Police Department many, many questions, and they will not go on the record. You know, they say as a policy, they do not comment on ongoing court cases. Um, I have spoken to the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, you know, and their lead public information officer. And again, he insists that even that indirect influence was not a factor in these early cases. So I've gone outside and I've talked to other people who have prosecuted sex crimes before, saying, can an important political connection in a family alter the direction of these cases? So I spoke to a former sex crimes prosecutor for Los Angeles County named Samuel Dordulian. He was the deputy district attorney. And he said in his experience, these family connections can definitely be a factor. Here's what he told me. Oftentimes you probably will get that phone call. Hey, you know, you do realize who this person is. So you take extra care. You slow it down probably more than you would have otherwise. If it's one of those cases where it's literally, you know, 50-50 on whether you should file, you'll, you'll probably hesitate. So he thinks it could be a factor. I spoke to Laura Dunn, who is a D.C.-based attorney who represents victims of sexual assault in cases like this. She says that she also feels that, you know, people with political influence and, you know, and families with influence do get different treatment in the justice system. Campbell's former attorney really denies this. He says that, look, Andrea Campbell at the time was a really vocal voice on the council for police reforms. She was not widely liked by the police department. If anything, if they knew that this was her brother, it would be more of a motivation to investigate him. So it's very hard to know. I think there are valid arguments on both sides. But this whole exercise also shows the limits of our transparency laws here. You know, there's such a lack of of accountability and to be able to look at the steps that police took each time because this whole record is shielded from us. So we Mm. have to look at every angle we can. And unfortunately, there are just not truly satisfying answers. Mm. You're not the first to report on how our legal system fails victims of rape and sexual assault. Have you seen any improvements in recent years for how police handle these cases? There is a legislative proposal to make it easier for victims to access their own reports. As far as this taping, you know, that is still hanging in the balance. You know, when it comes to this case and the decisions that police made early on when they were dealing with early accusations against who eventually became an alleged serial rapist, experts I spoke to said this is really a cultural problem within police departments, that there is a real hesitancy to aggressively pursue these early reports. Here's a little bit of what Melissa Morabito, the professor from UMass Lowell, told me. Just because these cases are hard to prove is not a reason not to go forward, right? That we owe that to victims of sexual assault, that if they are brave enough to come forward and report the crime and go through the sexual assault kit, which we know is incredibly invasive, right, that that we owe them that much to take the case further. So her point is that if we are asking victims to come forward and talk to police about, you know, these horrible things that happen to them, police departments need to be much more willing to believe them and aggressive in pursuing their cases, even if someone is too scared or reticent to take the stand themselves. They should pursue other ways to corroborate their narratives. And then in prosecutors' offices, they need to be more willing to take some risks and lose some cases. As she said, these cases are extremely hard to prove. But that does not mean that we should not try to take them forward. Only one in five of these reports ever lead to arrest. Even fewer result in convictions. She thinks if there was more of a willingness to take a risk and to be more aggressive in prosecuting these cases, that those numbers could climb. Understood. Well, Walt, thank you so much for your reporting and coming through to the comment to talk to us about it. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And if you or someone you know has been the victim of sexual assault or rape, you can call the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center at 800-841-8371. That's 800-841-8371. And that's our show for today. Thank you so much for listening to The Common. I'm Daryl C. Murphy, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.